Okay, so this session is on um, is on translating models for policy change. Um, the um, three speakers will now be uh, Dr. Madhav Marasi will be the first speaker, and he's from uh, uh, Virginia Tech, and he's um, a, a co-PI on a, a multi-scale modeling pro project funded through this initiative with Allison Galvani on um, social factors and individual decision making in vaccines. But um, realizing that our audience is wider than just health and that all of our speakers were sort of from the health field, he's going to actually address modeling and and multi-scale modeling and some other domains that are important in policy. Um, Dr. Bruce Lee will speak next. He's the recip he's at Johns Hopkins University um, with a very recently funded um, UO1 from the multi-scale modeling initiative on uh, virtual population obesity prevention. But he um, has been working in fields of modeling and public health and public health policy and, and with a specific emphasis on obesity prevention among other things for quite a long time. And by the way, all the bios for all these people are on um, on the wiki. And the third speaker will be um, uh, Ross, <laughs> I'm blanking on your last name, Hammond. Um, <laughs> Who, um, who's at the Brookings Institution. Um, he's not a member of the Multiscale Modeling Consortium, but has done a lot of modeling in public policy areas. And the, the goal of this session was, of course, the emphasis on policy. We don't actually have a lot of projects that are looking at things at the population level or that relate to policy. I was hoping that maybe some of our other IMAG agencies might have people working on things like climate change or ecological modeling that affect policy, but I guess we don't have anything in that field. It would be good to have more in all of those areas. Um, and, and the questions to keep in mind are really, you know, the, the ones again posted on the wiki of successes and failures, and particularly in this field, um, the idea of acceptance. That is, um, which I think we've dealt with in this consortium before, and more in the field of medical diagnostics. But you know, the question you can make a beautiful model, but will it be accepted by end users, and how do we deal with those questions? So, without further ado, I, I would like to just start. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I want to thank Grace and Susan for kindly inviting me. Just a small correction. I um, work very closely with Allison. We don't have a grant together. Nevertheless, uh, what I'm going to talk about has certainly been funded by multiple agencies, uh, including the NIH Midas Project and uh, agencies at uh, the DOD and NSF as well. So <clears throat> as I was making my slides, I decided to uh, expand the scope a little bit because I felt that we have a lot of talks which focus on health, uh, but hopefully we can uh, also talk about other problems like Susan was mentioning. I certainly won't talk about climate, but we'll be able to talk about things that we might enjoy nevertheless. Uh, so I want to thank uh, all the agencies that have funded us over these years, uh, IARPA, NSF, uh, VITRA, um, MIDAS at NIH, and, and also our collaborators, uh, Allison, uh, Alex, uh, John Brownstein and others. So what I'm going to focus on is a uh, study of socio-technical systems. And uh, to start, I just want to point out that social networks, human behavior, policies, and infrastructures are very closely intertwined. And in some ways, the world is getting smaller. The interdependencies between these systems is only increasing rather than decreasing. And uh, we see a lot of efficiencies and, and uh, and uh, connections derived from these kinds of interdependencies. But at the same time, uh, we also have uh, potential opportunities uh, that go with it and the risks to environment and social stability that go with systems like this. Examples of systems like this 
the ones I'm going to talk about include the transport network or the urban systems or the electrical power grid or the public health infrastructure, um, the financial systems. And the interesting part of these systems is that they have a human element, but they also have a technical element. They are spatially very diverse. There are multiple scales inherently represented in them. They are very heterogeneous, and that's the hallmark of these systems. Dynamic, and I think what differs in a, in a big way as far as we are concerned and makes it interesting from a computational standpoint is they are in a mesoscopic scale. They're not so small that you can study them um, you know, with current models in a, in, a, in a detailed manner in a particular form, but they're not also so big like physical systems where you can lump them and use you know, statistical mechanics directly. Uh, so networks are the right mathematical representations for it, in our opinion, and I'm going to talk about these systems as I go along. So uh, in conjunction with the convergence or you know, becoming a small world network in, in, in social technical systems, we also have pervasiveness of data and computing both data and access to computing is pervasive. You can use data and do computing at any place, any time, any device. This is a term that Mark Weiser used effectively. And with it, people, uh, individuals, organizations, policy analysts, now want to make pervasive real-time personalized decisions. This is something that they started to expect in, in a sense. And decisions can be small such as whether I want to go to a movie or not uh, and quickly you know, meet with my friends on the social network, or a decision that has to do with controlling a pandemic uh, in a particular form. So what we are uh, here in, in our group uh, focusing on is modeling, but modeling not just for predictive uh, reasons. I think we, are, we think the modeling is much more interesting uh, use uh, in, in this particular setting. And what we think is that modeling can be used for integrated reasoning about situations and actions. And you'll see some examples that I'll build on. There's a very nice uh, editorial article by Feinberg and Wilson during the H1N1 outbreak that makes many, many points that I wanted to make. So I would uh, refer you folks to take a look at a short one pager. It was done in the context of epidemic science, but I think many of the points they make are actually applicable to other social technical systems as well. So what is the approach that we have taken in our group? Um, this approach has uh, sort of been developed over approximately 25 years now. We started working on this at Los Alamos, uh, and then we moved to Virginia Tech subsequently. And you will see a sense of maturity to this idea, but you'll also see a lot of open questions as I go along. So in a nutshell, the way we would like to solve this problem, or at least to present this problem, is what we call creating social habitats and living social habitats, which means that they are not static entities. Uh, they are constantly, dynamically evolving and changing. And I use the word habitat to represent not uh, just the humans, but also the environment in which they are embedded. Um, so we have a tutorial uh, that we did for at the AI conference called HKI and the agents conference called AMAS. And I've given you the link here for folks who are listening. They can go ahead and Take a look at a tutorial. There are lots of papers there. Um, so <clears throat> what we do is the first step in the three-step process. I'll describe the three steps quickly and then go to policy applications to illustrate how this can be used. The first step is to create this synthetic environment uh, or a data structure from which we can do modeling with. And we call it this uh, the environment, a synthetic information system or a social a synthetic living habitat. What it is, is a collection of synthetic agents, and Ross and Bruce both are going to talk about it. So it's wonderful, actually, that the talks are organized this way. I think that's the connection that three of the talks have here. Um, a synthetic agent to us is a representation of an agent. Uh, an agent can be a place, a, a thing, IoT devices are also agents, people. Uh, but the intent is that the attributes and the behavioral properties that you associate with it are not intended to precisely match the snapshot of the system or of a particular agent in the population. So I use the word synthetic in two ways here. One is that the agent is comprised by synthesizing lots of diverse information sets. The second way I use the word synthetic is because you cannot associate the agent directly with a particular agent in the population. It turns out to be important and interesting to do this because of privacy reasons, and Bruce and, and Ross are going to talk about it for sure. So examples of a synthetic human agent 
uh, having characteristics could be demographic characteristics, and uh, you know, I'll leave it to them to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, social and health characteristics, cognitive attributes, cultural attributes, and uh, interestingly, more and more data is available to try and build this out. So how one goes about doing this is an interesting question, right? And my first point is that endless measurements cannot solve this problem. Uh, I really do not think that these problems can be solved only by measurements. We have to use social, cognitive, behavioral theories and the data that we have to integrate them. And that's why the synthetic information system makes a lot of sense. You're synthesizing available data in a meaningful form that is consistent with the available hypothesis and the data sources. So we have done this for um, social proximity networks, but we also done it for power networks. Here's an example of what we do for social networks. Um, and since we're going to hear more about it, I'll go through it quickly. But effectively, you use information from census, street maps, information about activities, activity locations, um, <clears throat> how people move around, what sort of families we have to construct a rather interesting social proximity network that actually evolves in time. We started doing this back in 1992. Uh, I think probably the first group to have done systems of this so so sort, and I'll say a little bit later. And many, many folks now use this idea and they've actually expanded on this in a, in a significant way. And the second two talks will certainly talk about this in detail. So multiple scales are inherent in these systems, right? Scales in terms of movements, scales in terms of representations, you know, within a single person versus a family versus a community that the person is, movement patterns, people moving within a, within a community, going across for work, going across cities, going across countries, uh, and there are different ways to collect data to try and build models for it. And I think one of the you know, very interesting things that's starting to happen is availability of micro data from GPS style devices, uh, convenience surveys, and other information sources that were simply not available 10, 12 years back, which I think make this very interesting question. Phone call records, uh, you can actually merge all these things in a way that you can preserve privacy uh, and anonymity of sources. So at the end, what this gives you is uh, a coordinate system, really. Think about this as a social or socio-technical coordinate system on which you can take different data sources and put them together in a manner that they're consistent, right? Uh, and this, this is a sort of a social geometry, if you want to call it, that allows you to do certain kinds of uh, transformations and manipulations uh, to keep in account the space, but the individual attributes as well. So we've done this. We started with a very small program back in Los Alamos with Albuquerque, uh, went all the way to Portland before we left uh, Los Alamos. But now we have actually developed this technology uh, fairly uh, well, and we finished the first digital library of a global database of this, these kinds of regions. There are seven billion agents now. In some places, it's much more detailed in other places, obviously. US is very detailed, UK is very detailed. Um, parts of Middle East, Middle East are not that detailed. Um, West Africa, after the Ebola exercise, became much more detailed. So as incidences come out, details get added. Details are also depend on the specific questions that our sponsors ask. So we have a lot of details that are relevant to flu or infectious diseases. We don't have as many details for problem as what Ross is studying here in terms of obesity. Um, the second step then is to study causal models on top of this coordinate system or the networks that you've created. And the models are used for both interpolation, because after all the data that you have produced is effectively a snapshot, but you have lots of gaps in the data. So these models really are trying to fill a causal gap in this, you know, a, a, a gap that exists, but also extrapolation and consistency checking. So again, we started with, uh, with very modest resources uh, back in 1991. In fact, doing cluster computing was a non-trivial challenge then. But since then, we've actually scaled up our simulations substantially. And just um, six months back, we did a run on a big a machine at Livermore with our colleagues there, uh, where we can do a, a simulated flu season in US, 300 million nodes, approximately 15 billion edges, a trillion interactions on a rather large machine, 750,000 cores, in about 10 seconds now. Now, the reason to do it this way, and I think you heard the first panel speakers talk about it, is when you want to do uncertainty quantification, you want to run multiple runs, and Gary, I think, talked about this too. 
you want to make tons and tons and more tons of runs, you need systems that can go that fast because one run is really not at the heart of the problem at all. But nevertheless, you need to do that speed. Apparently, it's taken really interesting technological challenges that I'm happy to talk about later on uh, about this. Um, so the third and final step, and then we go to the application, is building a, a infrastructure so that policy makers can use this thing. So the thing we learned very in a hard way during our time at Los Alamos when we worked on a project, which I'll describe next, is that policy analysts are not interested in becoming computer scientists. We had this strange feeling there that we're all happy to code and everybody would be happy to do the same, but found out nobody wanted to use our models. And I think our uh, opening remark uh, said uh, much to this, this point. So we effectively started building systems through apps in which the system models are really hidden from the end user, if so, the end user so chooses. Now, the end user can certainly go back and make changes, but the end user can really use this. And the way we want to think about this is, is to get access to the system, much like Google gives you access to query. But now you're doing policy questions. Okay, you don't care where the data is stored. You don't care where the computation is done. You just want to state the question in a fairly precise manner, and you want to get the answers. And that's what policymakers are interested in. So I'll tell you three examples, uh, three programs, and I'll take one example from each program to give you a sense of how this uh, pro is set up. I'll talk about a program that has to do with urban transport planning, and this will also give you a sense of time. Then I'll talk quickly about a national planning scenario exercise um, that the first speaker actually said a little bit about, and I'll end with uh, the work we've done for Ebola and Zika, and I'll also mention other people's work as I go along. So the first program that I'll mention, and then the particular policy question, is a program called Transcends. Um, it's an it's a urban transport planning system that we've created between 1992 and 2001 when we were at Los Alamos, and this was actually not done because we felt that we want to make a system, but this was asked by the regional governments as well as DOT and Federal Highway Trust Fund uh, because of important policy questions that they were addressing. And EPA had been just set up then, um, and uh, the question was about Clean Air Act and the emissions that, that uh, went, went around. So Transit was set up to sort out important national problems, assess traffic flows, understand questions of social justice, predicting environmental impact. And the key aspect is that during this 10-year period, when we did the, did the studies with them, we actually were embedded with first with Albuquerque, then with Dallas-Fort Worth, and then with Portland, to do very detailed studies and, and extend how the modeling technology got done. I'll only mention one that was done at the very end, and we were part of it, only uh, I would say half of the study. This was done, it's called the Watts study, and you folks might relate to it. It was a study to understand the impact of road closures in and around White House after the 9-11 incident. There was already a small perimeter that was closed, and the discussion was to close a bigger perimeter. And just a question of, you know, seems so simple, but it's a very interesting policy question, right? Uh, who pays for it? Who gets affected? How can you add public service, uh, you know, alternatives, the time, the cost? These are all impacts you want to study by trying to close this perimeter around, we studied questions like new tunnel construction, opening and closing streets, making the one ways in certain cases, traffic management, adding uh, you know, <laughs> infrastructure in terms of adding uh, metros and, uh, and buses to help people move around quickly. This study has been published uh, and was done with the National Capital Planning Commission for it lasted for seven years. It's a report on the, on the web. AECOM led the study. Um, this tool has been actually useful now and has been used for at least 40 different studies. People download it. Transcends is an open source system. Uh, Argon National Lab actually manages it. Uh, many, many different uh, case studies have been done using Transcends and its extensions. You know, it's certainly gone way beyond what we started with. Uh, Urban Sim program that Paul Waddell started at UC Berkeley and before at Seattle is really an offshoot of Transcends. He took many of the ideas from Transcends and extended it for land use problems. I'll talk about the second pr uh, problem. This has been going on now for 17 years uh, in, our, in our group. Uh, this is a program called CNIMS, and it's been funded by the DOD, and it's a system to do a comprehensive national incident management system. And the particular study that I want to quickly say is a study called the National Planning Scenario 1, and the scenario asks us, or asks 
folks to study what would happen if a 10 kiloton device goes off in downtown Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, there are 10 different scenarios, each of them you know, horrific in its own ways, but it's, it's important to understand that planning is, is still an important issue. Uh, the problem has been studied for 50 years at National Lab. Okay? So it's not that the problem has not been studied. It's a very, very important problem. The difference is much of the previous study was focused on you know, impact of overall health and prompt uh, impact, meaning you know, the damage that is done. It was not on the social and behavioral aspects that go with it. Uh, the study actually took it further. We have many, many uh, interesting conclusions, policy questions, and solutions that came about in terms of damage to the power network, uh, putting up an ad hoc network to improve the communication systems later on rather than sending first responders in. And you can find the results on, on our web page. So I'll quickly go to the, to the epidemiological part. Cecil actually covered it very well, so hopefully this makes my job very easy. My yellow light is up. Um, we participated during the Ebola crisis with DOD and uh, with NIH, BARDA, very closely. We were one of the lead analytical groups supporting the response efforts. And we did many, many interesting questions in, over a seven-month period. We were embedded with them, um, and I think it was one of the probably most interesting pieces of work we've done in the recent past because of the way it was structured. Um, there are other pieces of work people have done on this topic. Uh, Alison Galvani and her group has done a lot of work. Alex Vespiniani and his team has done a lot of work. Cecil actually ran a competition for Ebola forecast recently. Um, we've also done other studies. We've done approximately 30-odd studies for the government using these tools. Uh, just the public health side. The first one that we did when we were in Los Alamos had to do with smallpox. It, it was released and the effects that would happen. Uh, this, was, uh, this has been published. There was a nice study that our group, Ira Longini's group, and Neil Ferguson's group did. It was published in PNAS on target layer containment during H5N1 uh, work. And, and again, Alison has done a lot of work on Zika. So I want to summarize because my time is up. I want to say what we learned from this. The first thing we learned is that there's a very delicate balance between real-time you know, response and science. Uh, as scientists, we really want to make the results precise and publish, but you know, I, I've modified Tukey's theorem to say that you know, answering questions in time is actually rather important itself. Data sharing and making it accessible is the second important point. I don't think it's new for biologists as well. The third part that probably is new and interesting is embedded interaction. So all the interesting studies we did were where we were embedded with the policy makers when the, the questions were being studied. We felt it really changed the way the questions were posed and the solutions we got. VNV is something that you all have talked about. We can take this uh, in, in the, during the discussion section. And finally, the way we are actually kept on improving these tools is really through these case studies. We do a study, we derive the requirements, and hopefully we are better prepared for the next eventuality. So I'll stop here and take questions, uh, maybe later on, right, Susan? Um, if anyone has just a clarifying question, and um, if you while we can Go ahead. start changing over the presentation. Um, I think so. I, I really think there's a substantial change in, in how they perceive models. There is, uh, people are also not completely convinced, and there are certain areas where things are worse than others, but in, in public health, this was not a problem at all. You have to work with them very closely. We actually, there's a study that I would point out later on, we did with the White House Office for Emergency Preparedness with the, uh, you know, in the, in the OS, you know, OHS where we studied this as senior level exercise. So you do tabletop exercise with them, and it allows you to train them and understand the value of models, because they start asking questions once they're engaged. So I can say a little bit more and describe one particular incident if you want. Yeah, I think that's a good question that we should probably take up in the general discussion at the end. Okay, uh, I wanted to thank uh, IMAG as well as the MSM Consortium for this opportunity to talk. Uh, 
Um, so I'll be talking about uh, case studies, uh, multi-scale modeling for policymakers. I want to acknowledge uh, the team members that uh, helped to put together this presentation, Marie Ferguson, Bella Hadari, Claire Barts, and Sean Brown. Uh, so this is a quick overview of, of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, addressing the need for more multi-scale system approaches in policymaking, and then basically going through four different case studies, some, ex some examples of how we've used multi-scale models to address uh, decision making. So all public health issues, all medical issues, in fact, all issues, period, uh, involve complex multi-scale systems. So this is an example of obesity. That's one of the things that we focus on at the Global Obesity Prevention Center at uh, Johns Hopkins University. But if you think about obesity, obesity is the result of not just single factors, single cause and effect relationships. That's been one of the issues over the past several decades that a lot of the treatments or interventions or policies that have emerged have assumed that uh, there's a specific cause and there's a specific effect when it comes to obesity. But in fact, obesity is a combination of multi, multiple systems at different levels and different scales. So for instance, you've got biological systems, behavioral systems, uh, social influences, social network, um, the environment, such as the physical activity environment or the food environment, uh, policy, economics, you know, what people can afford. There's many indications that uh, healthier foods and healthier lifestyles are more expensive, uh, and cultural influences as well. So if you really want to address a lot of these intractable public health issues or medical problems, you really have to address all these different systems at multiple levels. So what's the danger of not using these systems approach, these multi-scale systems approaches? Well, first of all, you come up with these band-aids rather than solutions. You can see in the uh, uh, lower left-hand corner. Uh, and many of these quote-unquote solutions are quite unsustainable. You might see results or effects temporarily, but ultimately these systems uh, have homeostasis, so they tend to just compensate ultimately over time. So we've seen examples, for instance, uh, the television show Big, Biggest Loser, uh, when many of the uh, contestants lost large amounts of weight over uh, relatively brief periods of time. Subsequent studies have shown that a lot of this weight was regained. And in some cases, contestants actually uh, gained more weight from when they, they first started. Uh, you're also missing many secondary and tertiary effects. So when you have an intervention or a policy, uh, you can have many positive and negative uh, indirect effects. So if, there, if you're missing positive effects, you're actually underestimating the value of an intervention or policy, which is very important when you're actually trying to advocate for the policy or communicate the importance of the policy. And of course, there's also unintended consequences. So there are many examples of policies that are very well-meaning, interventions that are well-meaning, but over time they found that they actually had the reverse effect. An example of that is uh, our, uh, some school policies to change uh, what stock and vending machines. So try to swap in healthier foods uh, and swap out candy and sort of things like that. There have been some studies that have shown that that's actually had negative effects. So what happens is it can push kids outside school to get their food. So if they see that they can't get the soda, they can't get the candy in the vending machine, they'll go to the outlying corner stores, and in, in those cases they'll have more access to other types of unhealthy food, and they're actually spending time off campus. So that's an example of a negative effect from a well-meaning uh, intervention. And also you can expend considerable time, effort, and resources from trial and error. So if you're trying to intervene in these complex systems, you don't know what might actually happen. You toss out a toss in a intervention or policy, and it doesn't have the same effect. You've wasted a, a considerable amount of time and effort and resources. And in policy making, that's particularly important because you, many times you can't hit the reset button. It's not like a laboratory where you can say, okay, let's do an experiment again. Once it's done and it has either no effect or a negative effect, it's very difficult to uh, collect everyone and say, okay, let's try again. Uh, many times you have a window when it comes to policy making, and once you pass that window, it's tough to go back. So for all these reasons, uh, computational modeling, mathematical modeling, multi-scale modeling in particular, can play a very important role uh, in policy making. Now I want to emphasize that modeling is not a replacement for other types of study methodologies. That's one concern many times when you uh, interact with decision makers, they're worried. Uh, and I, I call this the quote-unquote Skynet concern, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Terminator movies, where 
there's a concern that there's going to be a computational program or algorithm that will replace the decision maker. That's not the case. Uh, Multi-scale modeling, the purpose of it is to enhance decision making and translate decision making. So here we have a uh, need or idea, retrospective study, prospective study from policy and practice. Multi-scale modeling can really serve as a bridge between these different things. It can help plan different types of retrospective, prospective studies. It can help overcome some of the limitations of those studies, like such as data availability, journalizability, granularity, and translate those to policies and practice. One of the key things with modeling when you're um, trying to help facilitate policy making and decision making is that modeling has to be an iterative process. You aren't going to disappear into a cave, uh, uh, create a model that's a black box, come back and say, okay, the answer is seven, or the answer is uh, X, Y, and Z. It's important for policy makers and decision makers to understand what you're doing, and many times this involves an iterative process. So they need to have an understanding of what's under the hood. Maybe not every single detail, but they have to feel ownership of the model. They have to feel like that this was a model that was developed in conjunction with their expertise and their experience. So that's why what we try to do is we convene multidisciplinary teams. We create these mathematical computational models to represent the multi-scale system. Uh, these can help elucidate important factors and relationships, guide prior and prioritize data collection, test different policies and interventions, and then that can inform stakeholders that can lead to uh, changes in the design and implementation of interventions that can then generate more data and results and that can be allowed to, uh, that can help update the model. So it's this iterative process that, that circles and circles throughout the situation. So you shouldn't feel pressure to get the model exactly right the first time around because many times decision makers have to make decisions um, in the midst of uncertainty. They may not have all the data, they may not have all the information, but they have to make the decision. And many times, as Mata, for instance, uh, mentioned, it's under uh, duress. It's un, you know, in, the, in the course of a pandemic or an epidemic. Uh, you can't tell the epidemic or the pandemic to hold on. You know, we've got to run the models. Okay, and then you can start spreading after that. So speaking of uh, epidemics or pandemics, the first case study is from the H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009. During that pandemic, uh, Dr. Sean Brown, who's the um, uh, Director of Public Health Applications uh, at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and myself, uh, as well as connected with our teams, were embedded in the uh, in, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, specifically within uh, ASPR and BARDA. Um, and we used a number of different models. One of the models that we used was an agent-based model uh, of different locations throughout the United States. So these agent-based models essentially pull from uh, synthetic population that was developed by Bill Wheaton and um, uh, Phil Cooley at uh, RTI, uh, Research Triangle Institute uh, in North Carolina. Basically, this, this synthetic population represents every single person in the entire United States. Uh, each of these um, computational agents are then assigned to households with other agents, and then we can pull from uh, the U.S. population if we wanted to, for instance, generate a model of the D.C. metro area or Pennsylvania or, or in fact the entire United States. And basically every day these uh, agents move from home uh, to schools, to workplaces, to communities, and then they mix with each other. Um, and then they can transmit uh, influenza to each other or other types of infectious diseases. So this is a visualization, whoops. This is a visualization showing the um, uh, spread of influenza in Pennsylvania. So basically what we do is we create uh, an epidemic, seed, uh, seed the population, and watch the spread, and we can layer on different types of interventions. So one example of a study that we did was we looked at the impact of uh, delays in uh, vaccines being distributed to uh, different populations. And for instance, if you have a limited number of vaccines, which populations should get the vaccines first? This was published in Health Affairs. But this was important because in, during the course of the pandemic, uh, the vaccine manufacturers were hurrying to try to create the new vaccine, the new vaccine with the new strain. And that caused delays. So it, basically the vaccines weren't ready until the fall, which was the second wave of the pandemic. So one of the questions was, which populations should get prioritized when they get, um, uh, get the uh, new flu vaccine? So we looked at the impact of prioritizing different types of populations, for instance, low-income populations versus 
higher income populations versus middle income populations. What we found was that there was a benefit to everyone in prioritizing a lot of the lower income populations. Because if you think about a lot of uh, low income neighborhoods uh, have higher uh, density populations, there's uh, extensive mixing, and there's a lot of movement from low income uh, neighborhoods to high income neighborhoods. You know, a lot of people go to work in higher income neighborhoods and then return back to lower income neighborhoods. The converse is not true. A lot of people who live in high income uh, neighborhoods don't necessarily go to lower income neighborhoods. So as a result, more spread or more transmission occurs within low income neighborhoods and that actually affects high income neighborhoods as well. So I won't go through these results in detail, but this essentially shows what happens if you delay the delivery of vaccines to some of the lowest income neighborhoods. We used our uh, Washington DC Metro model to, to look at this. And we found that uh, these delays have significant effects on um, the epidemic curve. So the conclusions from the study was that people are highly interconnected in the system, they're not isolated islands, uh, that uh, poor communities are important, they have high density and heavy mixing, and they have tr uh, significant travel among uh, higher income uh, locations. And this is an example of selfless altruistic behavior actually having selfish utilitarian benefits. This was a multi-scale model because it basically modeled for the population, it modeled at the household level, the um, school level, and it also modeled the uh, physiology and the, um, the characteristics of the uh, virus. A second, second example is uh, looking at the redesign of vaccine supply chains. So vaccine supply chains are the series of processes, um, components, equipment, personnel, transport vehicles that are all involved in getting vaccines or, or any other uh, medical product from one location out to the population. So we've developed a uh, software platform form called Hermes, uh, which can basically take data or information from any type of supply chain uh, and then generate a discrete event simulation model of the supply chain. And through that, we can uh, evaluate uh, different types of supply chain metrics and uh, economic impacts as well as health impacts as well. So this is a multi-scale model as well because it basically looks at the population level, it looks at the operations, it represents individuals, and then their uh, uh, disease production, it represents all the vaccines, and then the effects of the vaccines, including thermostability, antigenic effects, and things like that. So throughout this uh, uh, development of the Hermes model and our work, pretty much since uh, 2007, 2008, we've worked with a number of different uh, policymakers, a number of different decision makers. Uh, here's a timeline basically going from 2009 to 2016. As you can see, we've worked with numerous ministries of health, uh, worked with a number of organizations like the Gates Foundation, uh, Gavi, UNICEF, uh, WHO, uh, Clinton Foundation, et cetera. All of this work has involved heavy interactions with all these different types of decision makers. So again, we, this modeling was not done in isolation. It was very important to get everyone to understand what we were doing and add transparency to the model. In other words, uh, we needed to make sure that they understood all the assumptions that were going in the model and, and how we were representing everything. So here's an example. Um, this is a visualization of the Benin vaccine supply chain. Benin is a country, the Republic of Benin is a country in West Africa. Uh, so we work very closely with a number of different partners, including the Ministry of Health. Here, this is a visualization showing all the different locations within the supply chain. The, uh, the heights of the column represent the inventory of vaccines in that location uh, for that specific day. So you can see it going up and down, and then you can see these transport routes occurring because there are these flashes of lines between the different locations. The color of the column is proportional to the amount of inventory that's in the um, uh, in that location at the time. Uh, the more red it becomes, the more uh, close to capacity or over capacity it goes. So here's a quick timeline in how we um, engaged or worked with the Benin Ministry of Health. As you can see, there's a lot of prep work that led up to the actual modeling. So we engaged, uh, we worked with uh, some in-country partners, uh, including AMP and the uh, WHO Afro. And uh, the Ministry of Health had expressed interest in understanding the, what's the impact of introducing new vaccines into uh, their country, the uh, rotavirus vaccine, pneumococcal meningococcal vaccine, 
And then in the process of engaging them, it became apparent that they were very interested in evaluating the current design of the vaccine distribution system and were open to alternative designs or redesigning the um, supply chain. So then in concert with the Ministry of Health and the Minister of Health, uh, we developed several different scenarios which we then modeled. So what happens, for instance, if you remove different levels, remove different locations, consolidate locations, change how transport is being, being done, what's the impact on disease, what's the impact on uh, cost, and all those different things. So again, without going into further detail, this summarizes some of our findings, but as a result of this work, the Ministry of Health, uh, along with other evidence and other uh, motivations, the Ministry of Health decided to redesign their vaccine supply chain. So that's been ongoing. So we have an opportunity of really comparing what actually happened as a result of the changes with what we identify with the modeling results. So this is an example of actively the uh, multi-scale modeling actively influencing decision making and then the ability to sort of track the decision making and the changes um, with each passing year. A third example is looking at the impact of cooperation among different hospitals in preventing and controlling healthcare associated infections. So this is work that we've done. Uh, it's been funded by AHRQ and CDC. And we've been working closely with uh, different uh, health departments as well as different hospitals and hospital networks. So we've developed a platform called REA, which stands for Regional Healthcare Ecosystem Analyst. This basically can take data from any health system and then create a, a large-scale agent-based model representing each of the healthcare facilities in a location, as well as the community and all the patients that are moving amongst the different facilities. It also can represent the transmission of different types of infections, such as MRSA, uh, uh, Clostridium difficile, VRE, uh, CRE. So that just described REA. Basically, REA uh, generates this uh, large-scale agent-based model. Our first uh, sample county that we've modeled uh, is Orange County, California. These are some of the specifics about Orange County. It's a very large metropolitan area. It has 32 hospitals, 71 nursing homes. All of these we represented within the large-scale agent-based model. Uh, it's also relatively enclosed. Uh, ocean to the west, forest to the east, undeveloped land to the south, and the biggest barrier, which is traffic to the north. So uh, here's an example of a paper that we published in Health Affairs where we were working with the CDC looking at the impact of different healthcare facilities within a region actually cooperating when it comes to implementing different types of infection control policies. So for instance, if they're communicating with each other, they're trying to implement the same type of policies. Um, we, we showed that there are many benefits with cooperation. Well, first of all, facilities that don't implement uh, these infection control policies benefit from those that do in basically free rider effects. So for instance, this, um, this table shows that uh, some sample hospitals, uh, A through K, that first column shows what happens if the infection control policies are implemented in that specific hospital only. Uh, so the, the policies that were of interest here are uh, testing everyone to see if they have MRSA and then isolating those that do have MRSA. So for instance, you see Hospital A has about 14.9% decrease in relative uh, prevalence of MRSA if they alone implement these uh, policies. It has a 2.2 decrease in prevalence if the five highest capacity hospitals in the uh, county implement these, these uh, interventions. So obviously, hospital A is not part of the five highest capacity hospitals, but they're gaining benefits. Even though they're not doing anything, they're gaining benefits from other, the largest hospitals implementing uh, HAI prevention and control strategies. And then if all hospitals do it, then it's a 20% decrease. And you can see that's about 5% greater than uh, that hospital implementing uh, the policy and interventions alone. So there's two phenomena you can see here. One is the free rider effect, which is 2.2%. And two is synergies, or basically being able to achieve a higher level of control than working alone. So if, if everyone's cooperating, they can achieve a 20.2% 20 decrease versus a 14.9% decrease. So basically, we ran a number of different scenarios to show the hospitals, show, show the county health department, show the CDC what's the benefit of this co cooperation. I think I'm running short in time, so I'll quickly go through these last slides. The last case study is the work that we've been doing within obesity prevention and control. 
So again, um, as uh, Susan had mentioned, this, this is uh, funded by the um, M I IMAG MSM U01. Uh, we're developing what's called a virtual population for BC prevention, otherwise known as BPOP, which is a little play on the word K-POP. And these are basically sim cities for obesity prevention and control. So we're, we're creating representations of entire cities. Uh, these are agent-based models, which essentially have these computational agents. Each agent represents each person within the city. We represent key food uh, locations, as well as physical activity locations, schools, and households. And each of these agents uh, have an, has a an personalized embedded metabolic model, which is an adaptation of the metabolic model that Kevin Hall at the NIH initially uh, uh, developed that basically takes the calories in and the calories out and translates it to changes in weight and BMI. So we've developed a, um, uh, we've developed an initial representation of all of Baltimore. This just shows the visualization. Uh, you can zoom in and out, but basically once we get to the uh, city level, you can see each of the different food sources and uh, physical activity locations are mapped out. Each of those have different, um, different characteristics. So uh, for instance, it's a park uh, and the hand is moving around looking for different food sources. And in a moment, what you'll see is you'll see, we'll add some of these agents, not the entire population, there's be a lot of people, but the actual simulation includes all, uh, the entire population. So here are represent representations of some of the uh, agents moving around uh, going to places like school, going to workplaces, stopping at um, uh, corner stores, stopping at uh, uh, parks, exercising. You know, each of these have different implications on what they do throughout the day and, and how many calories they burn and how many calories they take in. And using this, we can, we can represent different interventions and policies or see what happens if we just run the simulation over a number of years with existing conditions and see how obesity will change. So, through this work, um, we've been working with a Baltimore policy working group, which basically includes 30-plus uh, working group members that represent all of the key uh, stakeholders when it comes to food, physical activity, uh, and anything that might affect uh, obesity. So this includes uh, Baltimore City Council members, Health Department members, Recreation Park representatives, wholesalers, retailers, et cetera. Uh, so one quick example of how we've used um, our Baltimore modeling work to help influence policy. In 2014, uh, there was a farm bill that was uh, being considered. Uh, that one of the council members was in, uh, interested in introducing uh, something that would require all SNAP retailers to stock at least seven items for each category. So we've been exploring the impact of, of that. Uh, we've also been, we've also used our modeling to uh, represent or stimulate what might happen uh, if a bill that was uh, introduced, sponsored by uh, city council member Pete Welch uh, that will uh, present a 90% tax credit for anyone who takes their vacant lot and converts that to urban farm. Um, so we generate a result of what might happen if you do that, and we showed how that might impact obesity prevalence, how might that, that might impact you know, uh, other health care issues as well as costs, and that helped um, provide uh, testimony Here's a policy brief that, that, uh, that showed the impact of that, and ultimately here's news that the, uh, the bill uh, uh, eventually passed. So that's an example of modeling helping support um, public health decision making. So with that, I think I'm out of time, but um, happy to answer some questions now or during the panel session. Uh, but I wanted to acknowledge our System Science Core team uh, that really has uh, done a lot of uh, work um, and effort not just um, with developing the models uh, and, and running simulations, but also interacting with different types of decision makers to, uh, to make scenarios or develop scenarios and models that are very relevant to decision making. With that, thank you for the time. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll hold all the discussion to the end. These talks are all very synergistic. And my own. Wait for my slides to come up here. Uh, first, I just want to thank the organizers of this for inviting me. This is my first time in this IMAG group, and I'm impressed with everything I've seen so far. I'm pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to have a slightly different 
Can you optimize this for the, there we go. That's better. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach because one of the challenges uh, in policy modeling is always the gap between the subjects that are of greatest interest to the modelers and that the scientists think they can do the best job at tackling and the topics that the policymakers actually care the most about in terms of outcomes. Um, and we've heard a lot of emphasis in the earlier panels uh, on biology, um, but many of the outcomes that policymakers tend to want to know about have to do with behavior and dollars. Um, and particular behaviors uh, like eating and smoking that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm a social scientist, which I think puts me in the relative minority uh, in this audience. Uh, but a lot of my work is actually about how to bridge the world below the skin and the world above the skin. And for very good reasons, science tends to be organized to step, study these things separately. Um, but a lot of the problems that policymakers care the most about actually cross exactly that level of scale between things very, very much just under the skin and things very much just above the skin. Uh, and that's where a lot of my, my work has been. And the other thing that I'm going to try to emphasize in my talk um, is how uh, we've been able to bring these approaches uh, from their initial pop population health application in infectious disease uh, into these big areas of chronic disease um, and uh, the sort of trajectory that that work has taken over the last 10 years and is now sort of ready to engage with policy in a real way, and that's what, that's what I'm primarily going to focus on. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into great detail on any of the specific models that I'm going to touch on, although I'm happy to answer questions about them later. Uh, but I'm going to focus instead on giving you a sense of the overall arc of this work uh, and uh, provide you with some general reflections uh, from this work about the intersection of models and policy. Uh, before I proceed, I should state that uh, I, ha I hold a number of formal advisory appointments that are policy-oriented at the FDA, CCP, at NIH, and at the Lancet Commission on Obesity, but nothing that I say in this talk should be in any way construed to represent any opinions of any of these august bodies. They're only my own. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about why we would want to build models to inform policy in the first place. So why does this panel even exist that, that we're up here talking about? Um, and the first reason on my list is because the process of model building itself, of building formal models where the assumptions are clearly stated and can be tested, actually causes a reexamination of implicit mental models by which most decisions are made most of the time still. Uh, and so even if you don't use the model that's created to inform a decision, the process of building the model will alter the decision-making trajectory in many cases and is a very useful part of the exercise. The second uh, reason on my list is when appropriate real-world experiments are hard. Bruce talked about that earlier. There are many situations, particularly in a health context, where doing real-world experiments is unethical, uh, where you can do them, but they're incredibly expensive, uh, where they're very slow, or where they just can't get enough heterogeneity or be run for long enough periods of time to get at some of the outcomes of greatest interest to policymakers. The third reason is when there's enormous heterogeneity across individuals, contexts, or time, which can shape uh, the success or non-success of an intervention. The fourth one, which I don't think has been touched on uh, as much in, in the talk so far, so I'm going to try to emphasize it a bit, is the idea that uh, a policy can't be evaluated assuming everything else stays constant in the system, uh, that any intervention into a system that perturbs it is going to create adaptive response by other parts of the system. And that means that the short-run effects of a policy may be very different from the long-run effects. And if you're interested in sustainable policies, you really have to take that into account. This is a nice quote from an Institute of Medicine report specifically on the use of agent-based models to inform tobacco policy that I contributed to in 2015 that emphasizes this idea that you really don't know what your policy is going to do unless you've thought about adaptation seriously. And models can help us to do that. And finally, uh, there's enormous uncertainty uh, always in policy situations. Uh, and models can't remove uncertainty. And they don't replace the need for judgment or uh, making difficult decisions or trade-offs. But they can help manage uncertainty uh, considerably. Uh, and that, uh, in and of itself, has a lot of value. So why are we interested in models for population health in particular, which is going to be the emphasis of the examples I'm going to show? 
Well, population health has multiple mechanisms and determinants. It has lots of heterogeneity. It has lots of interaction effects, lots of adaptation. Uh, and uh, experiments can have practical and empirical limitations, as Bruce very ably spoke about earlier, uh, and it is characterized by lots of uncertainty. So all of this has brought the idea of modeling to the fore in population health rather recently. Uh, and it, I thought it would be illuminating for this audience who has experience with a wide variety of different kinds of models to uh, see how mainstream population health and obesity and tobacco groups in particular think and talk about modeling. Uh, and so I have a page excerpted here from a report that came out from the IOM in 2010 called Accelerating Progress in Obesity Prevention that I also played a role in uh, that has a whole appendix on models and the way one might think about using models for obesity prevention and the different kinds of models. And there is a terminology among mainstream population health groups in the NIH of, quote, system science, of thinking about a constellation of different methods that actually may not think they're closely related to each other that have been sort of grouped together under this rubric of system science. And this is language that is commonly used that's good to be aware of. Uh, one of these tools in particular is going to be the one I'm going to emphasize in my examples, which is agent-based modeling, which has been mentioned earlier. Uh, and I won't explain in too much detail, therefore, what it is. Uh, the reason agent-based modeling is particularly well-suited for the topics I'm going to address is because it has a great ability to engage with spatial structure. Uh, and in the topics I'm going to address, both the social structure, the social space, and the physical space are very important, uh, both as outcomes and as determinants of behavior. The second reason is because of this exact intersection between below the skin and above the skin, and agent-based models' ability to serve as a way to understand the coevolution of the world above the skin with the world below the skin, the coevolution of the physical environment with individual behaviors and choices uh, and health outcomes. And the third is because of this emphasis on adaptation and the way in which agent-based models are a natural fit for thinking about modeling adaptive behavior among strategic actors in a system such as those that govern the outcomes of obesity and tobacco. So there are now five active NIH networks using agent-based modeling in particular to study population health. Uh, one of them has gotten a lot of exposure already, the MIDAS network, which I belong to along with Madhav and uh, Bruce and uh, speakers from the first panel. This, the, but the, uh, that uh, success of the infectious disease application really caused a whole variety of other application areas to spring up. And uh, there's a network that's focused on multi-level modeling of childhood obesity etiology. Um, a network that's focused on inequality and health disparities, a network uh, that's focused on state and community tobacco control, and a very new network of teams looking at environmental influences on child health outcomes. And these are all groups actively using agent-based modeling that I've been a part of. And uh, what I want to do now is, before I launch into my examples, is to give you a typology of uh, how to think about the different applications that are policy relevant in population health that have sprung up. And for me, there really are three groups. There's a group of models that are really about etiology or about behavior. Uh, and these are often really important precursors to models that try to directly answer policy questions because policy models are only as good as the foundations on which they rest. And if you don't have a firm grasp of the etiology, uh, you may get very misleading answers from your policy model. So these are models which have policy implications in many cases, but they don't represent policies in the model explicitly. And for me, that's a really important distinction because it uh, implies a lot of caution that is needed in drawing policy answers from a model where policy is not represented. And I'm going to talk about that more in a bit. The second set of models are directly engaged with interventions, and they're doing it in a prospective way. And you've seen examples of this where we try to figure out ahead of time what a policy will do by using one of these virtual worlds in silico experimentation. And the third example, which I, uh, the third kind of models, which I have not yet seen examples of, look back at existing policy track records and try to understand how policies that have succeeded might be translated successfully to new contexts, what factors might matter in scaling and translation of policies across contexts and across time, um, and how to, how to get a more scientific grasp on that. So very quickly, a couple examples. Uh, in obesity, there were a number of uh, etiology models that was really where this field started with uh, agent-based modeling in obesity that focus on understanding the dynamic processes that uh, are most important in driving uh, 
the, the outcomes that we most care about. Uh, and importantly, these models turned out to be really central, as they were in the infectious disease context, in making sure that we get the right data. Because the data that was collected at the beginning of this exercise is not the data that's most important uh, driver of the outcomes of the models, and new data needed to be collected uh, along the way. So a quick, couple quick examples from this uh, National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity uh, project uh, and the um, Health Disparities Network. The first of these, uh, and again, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details of these models, uh, is really takes seriously the idea that in the brain, eating is controlled by three main control systems, uh, and that one of these systems, the cognitive system, gets almost all the attention from social and behavioral sciences, despite the fact that the other two are very powerful drivers of a lot of real-world instances of eating behavior. Uh, and so we set out to build good models of these other two systems and then link the three to have a better grasp on, from a neurobiological perspective, on what is actually driving eating behavior and how that's shaped by the environment. Uh, and this model uh, ended up having important implications for interpretation of empirical data. Uh, for example, by demonstrating that the most important aspects of food environments um, may not be the food environment that someone currently inhabits, but food environment from previous periods of their lives that shape their preferences and their habits. Uh, and there's a very confusing empirical picture that tries to link food environments with food outcomes uh, and with a very mixed picture, and this model helps shed some light on why that might be. And this also has implications for interventions because it highlights key developmental windows where intervention can have long-run uh, consequences with minimal, a minimal push in early childhood, and, it, and it's very specific about what those are. Uh, but it is not a model that engages with any actual real-world policy, like a sugar-sweetened beverage ban, for example. The second example I'm going to quickly talk about uh, is a model that's about social influence on body mass index. And there's been enormous uh, outpouring of empirical and network studies that attempt to demonstrate some sort of contagion effect or diffusion effect in obesity, some sort of social influence effect. There's actually pretty good experimental evidence for a number of different kinds of social influence effects, but there's been almost no modeling of what that process actually looks like and therefore what its implications are for policy and how you would harness it uh, to improve obesity. And this is a model that makes a first foray into that space. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip my other examples and move to this second use of models where we are directly engaging with policy. Uh, and where we want to think about what the likely effects of a policy change or intervention are going to be, taking into account diverse actors in the system, taking into account adaptation, long time horizons, and potentially heterogeneous context. Uh, and in the space of tobacco control, there's been enormous interest driven by policymakers and by the pragmatic realities of making policy in the space of tobacco in what are called point of sale policies. So these are policies that attempt to actually change the retail environment experienced by consumers of tobacco products in spatial ways, like zoning or like drawing boundaries around schools and saying there could be no tobacco within this uh, region, for example. And there's an open question about exactly what these policies will really do uh, and how the adaptive response by consumers and by retailers will shape long-run success of these policies. There's very few real-world examples. It's very hard to do experimentation in this space. Uh, and so we've built a model called Tobacco Town, um, which is about simulating these kinds of point of sale policies. It's based on an enormous amount of data, including some of the synthetic kind of population data that Matt referred to earlier. Uh, and it's a model in which we can actually manipulate the uh, physical geometry of the space, the demography of the place. We can look at very different places, wealthy places, poor places, urban places, rural places and many, many different combinations of policies and try to understand uh, over quite long periods of time uh, how different policies in isolation but also different combinations of policies that interact with each other are likely to play out. Uh, and we have initially uh, built this model using representative national level data from several different places, but we are now in the process of applying it um, to very specific contexts working closely with policymakers um, at both the community level, the city level in New York City, and at the state level in Minnesota uh, to actually explore uh, real policies that are under consideration, which I can't talk about in too much detail, in those places. Uh, and also, we're working to expand this model um, to scale it in the kinds of ways that were, that were referred to earlier. So very quickly, I want to talk about the third use of modeling, 
uh, this retrospective modeling. And uh, this is a, a place really to talk about this idea um, that is emerging in obesity prevention that because obesity is really a systemic problem, you have to take a systemic response to it. You can't hope to solve obesity by targeting one particular aspect. It's like a balloon. If you push over here, it just bulges over here. Uh, and this has led to a, a, a vogue, a fashion in a whole, of, whole of system or whole of community approaches um, that try to have multiple different aspects across multiple different sectors. And as you might imagine, these are very hard to do. They're also very hard to interpret if they work. It's not really clear what the secret sauce that led them to work was. There's been a number of notable examples uh, of this. Almost all of them are at the community level. And there's a growing consensus, I think, in this field that the community level um, is, a, is, a, is a sweet spot for intervention for chronic disease because it's a high enough level of scale that you can actually manipulate the built environment. You can do zoning policy. You can do, in some cases, tax policy. Um, and it's also a low enough level of scale that you can actually coordinate what's going on in transportation with what's going on on retail, what's going on in schools with what's going on in doctor's office. And you just can't do that kind of coordination at the federal level very easily, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, and uh, so this, this has become a, a very valuable approach, a whole of community approaches. But there's a recognition that although these work incredibly well in some well-documented cases, they also fail when they tr are translated to other contexts. So there's something we're missing about what it is about the context that matters. Uh, and so we are using modeling to help us uh, understand this by starting with retrospective modeling, going back and looking at successful and failed whole of community obesity prevention interventions, trying to build models that can explain what is actually going on in these cases. Uh, then testing these models with longitudinal data from a large randomized, cluster randomized controlled trial in Australia, uh, and then using them to actually field what essentially amounts to quasi-experiments where we are designing new interventions using the model that makes predictions about what will happen and fielding them in the real world and testing whether the model's uh, 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 predictions are actually borne out. This study is called COMPACT, and I'm happy to talk more about it during the question phase. I want to touch on two, two themes in my last a minute and 30 seconds plus extra slip time after the bell goes off. Um, the first of these is this idea of that, that I think the last two uh, examples I showed really embody that I think is a broader idea here um, that's in an article that a colleague and I published in JAMA Pediatrics last year. Uh, that's this idea that precision medicine needn't only be about treatment and only about biology that it can be about prevention, too, and that it can be about social and behavioral science, too, and that there's no reason in principle why we shouldn't try to tailor our prevention interventions in the same way we tailor our treatment uh, to context. Uh, and the context may turn out to be the community rather than the individual uh, here, as I've, as I've alluded to earlier. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the kinds of modeling approaches that people are taking in this world above the scan are the same modeling approaches that are going on below the scan. They just are called different things. And there's a lot of terminology that's very conflicted in this space. But I think there's huge opportunity here to learn across this chasm uh, and to profitably combine these two worlds, which I talk about in this article. And finally, uh, I want to briefly talk about this idea that using models to inform policy interventions is not easy. And there's lots of ways for it to go wrong. Uh, and a, an article, which I'd be happy to circulate uh, if there's interest in it, um, that I wrote last year at the request of the National Academy of Sciences is really about what are the best practices on both sides uh, of the communication between modelers and model users in policy, in policy uh, context for having this go well rather than go poorly. And there's a lot as I said, they can go wrong, uh, and I, I don't have time to go through this slide in detail, but I'm happy to talk more about this during the questions. I think there's a, a right way and a wrong way to go about modeling in a policy context or when policy is an explicit goal, uh, and it has to be done with a great deal of care because it's very easy to draw conclusions that aren't really warranted by the modeling work uh, and to go beyond the bounds of what's, I, I think, justifiable. Uh, I'd like to thank all the funders and my many collaborators, uh, and I'm only 30 seconds over. You want us all to come up here?
All the moderators can go up to the panel chair. We'll start reading the first question in, in, on the wiki, and then people can line up in the audience. Uh, first question from Anthony Santago. What are best practices to adequately explain model assumptions and model functionality to policy makers to give them confidence in the model's output? Uh, I think there should be multiple answers on the panel uh, to this. Uh, but for me, I think one of the most important best practices, as, which has already been alluded to by my colleagues earlier, is to engage with the intended policy audience early in the process, not march in with a fully completed model and analysis and, and, and uh, about which your intended audience has no prior exposure or knowledge and attempt to, to explain it and hope that it will be well received. Because in many cases, course corrections are needed uh, to ensure that the model actually answers the right questions uh, and is well situated to do that. And it's also really important, I think, for the, the user of the model, the end user, the, the consumer, if you like, to have a, a really firm grasp about what the model can do and what it can't do and why. Uh, and only when there's that understanding um, will uh, a, a, a stakeholder really feel comfortable using a model as part of the decision process, in my view. Um, just to add on to uh, Ross's insightful comments, um, it's also important to be able to speak the language of the decision makers. So uh, the goal there is not to say, okay, this is, this is the language, this is the information that you should know. It's very important to understand what they want to know and what type of language and what type of outcome measures they're interested in. So there are many situations in which we've seen you know, modelers will, ha will generate results from their um, models and from their experiments, but the outcome measures used aren't relevant to decision makers. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that you have to do is say, okay, what decisions do you have to make and what measures are you using? You know, are you interested in economic measures? Are you interested in combination of health measures, et cetera? If you, if you run a scenario and you are trying to and I, I put the word optimize in quotes, if you're trying to optimize the situation, if the decision makers are interested in something else, optimizing quote, quote, optimizing something else, then you're really going at cross paths and your information is not useful. Well, I'll just add uh, one point which I said in my slides as well, uh, that uh, the right form of model is very useful. Uh, we often, if you abstract the, the problem too much, then the conclusions you draw um, happen to be, in my opinion, not acceptable very easily. Uh, if, the, if the abstraction is very detailed and you cannot come up with a solution, that becomes a problem as well. And I think Ross did, did mention that. Last, a quick uh, point related to this, and I think Ross again said this, is confidence in these models in policymakers comes over time. Uh, I have, at least in my 30 years in this work, have not seen that the first time you made it, then they're all very happy. You really work with them for a period of time, and the confidence really builds as a part of this peer group and the social network that forms, and your success as it goes along. Thank you, Melissa Knoe to Tate from Sydney, Australia. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. When we write grant proposals or uh, ethics protocols, if we have experimental protocols, we have to have controls. The scientific method is underpinned by very uh, sound principles that I assume that you follow as well. And I'm wondering how do you uh, ensure that you don't introduce implicit bias into your models? How do you introduce controls that are truly controls if the system's adapting through your modeling process itself? And how do you prevent uh, specific lobbies from using your models uh, to influence policy in a biased way? All good questions. Um, I'll take a whack at some of them and then I'll pa pass it down to my, my colleagues here. Uh, as to the first question about um, how do we avoid bias creeping into our models? Uh, to some degree, no one can guarantee that they've prevented bias from creeping into their models, but we try hard uh, to follow 
what are quite established best practices uh, in the modeling field about how to uh, explore sensitivity of your model to each and every assumption that you include, to justify each and every assumption that you include, to support it as best as possible, uh, and to ensure that you actually understand the behavior of your model under a huge range of circumstances so that you can, any particular result you're reporting can be put appropriately in context of, 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 of all these assumptions. The other thing that you, that you mentioned um, that I want to touch on is this idea of uh, what happens to a model after it's done and who might use it and how might they use it, which is something that keeps modelers up at night worrying, um, uh, particularly in a policy context, because there's really no way to, uh, if you're following best practices about uh, transparency and replicability, there's really no way to prevent someone from misusing your model. Um, you can do your best to uh, couch uh, the explanation of the model in it with very clear statements about its limitations and its appropriate and inappropriate uses. You can be very clear about the uncertainty inherent in any result that you report. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, someone else can take your model and do something you didn't intend with it. Uh, and when you're working with a policy audience, it's really important actually up front to set those boundaries and be clear about what are appropriate and inappropriate uses. But, but afterwards, you have little control. Uh, again, another, a good question. Uh, so several things to add. So one is, uh, as Ross alluded to, the, the importance of sensitivity analyses. So sensitivity analyses are always very important, but especially important in pol uh, policy context. Uh, you have to run a full suite, uh, a systematic sweep of all the different variables that might be important and help everyone understand you know, how the system's really behaving. And that leads to the second point. Um, the key here is models can help elucidate relationships uh, and directions and trends and trajectories. They're not as good at precisely predicting what will happen. And that's, that's one of the inherent uh, misunderstandings that you'll run into many times. People say, okay, uh, run your model and tell me exactly what will happen in year 2020. You know, what's a specific number? And there can be a focus on that number. And so it's key to really kind of push back and say, okay, the model's not here to give you a specific number. You know, that, that was the problem with the stock market, for instance. People said, oh, you know, the models did not predict what would happen in 2008, 2007. But that's because the models weren't given the right inputs. They weren't modeling the right scenarios and situations. The models are correct in terms of the direction. So if, you know, the situation, the actual parameters were put into the model, it would have predicted what happened. Uh, to the stock market and what happened to the real estate market, et cetera. So really emphasizing that, you know, these models are to show that here's the relationship between these types of interventions, these factors, and what might happen, and keep emphasizing that because that's where modeling is really effective. Uh, it can help really understand uh, different policies. And transparency is the last thing. You really have to try to be as transparent as possible for what you're modeling. I'd like to add one thing from the sort of NIH perspective um, as a program officer. I've overseen many of the grants that have come through study section that involve this kind of policy modeling. And it, it's important to realize that they're not making up the data and putting it into models. The data will typically come from many of those controlled experiments and epidemiological and intervention trials and uh, surveillance data sets that are collected outside of the modeling sphere, and those are the inputs. And so if the research that you're doing is of high quality and is included in these models, then inherently the model benefits. So really, so that, that's one clarification I wanted to point out. And and all of the grants that have been in my portfolio that come through study section review, these are the kinds of questions that would be looked at when reviewers are critiquing the, the proposals for these um, applications you know, from the get-go. So if, if someone were to propose uh, getting funding for a model that wasn't based on good quality data or couldn't justify which variables and data sets and sources, then it likely wouldn't pass muster from the get-go. So that, that's one sort of point of clarification. 
I have a question for all six of you. That you guys have a decade of experience in having a policymaker or an individual kind of being at the end point of your research. And so all the rest of us now, for the first time in my career, are at a point where we need to start doing kind of the same thing, justifying our multi-scale models as being useful to individuals or, and getting them to tweet out positively about it. What, could you guys each say a few words about, uh, about uh, how you, as you say, build the network and, uh, and identify really metrics that are of interest to policymakers at the end and how you work with, say, NIH to really build, build that network up as being useful? From the NIH perspective, I worked for six years at the National Cancer Institute, and I was leading an initiative focused on community, state and community tobacco control. And in that science space, of course, tobacco has been controversial for many decades in the country, um, going all the way back to the early epidemiological um, linkages between tobacco use and cancer, which were not to, not wanted to be believed by industry and so forth. So you can imagine um, that they have a nice exemplar for how this could be done. Um, and and really, historically, what what the the researchers in this space were able to do was to connect and form kind of advocacy groups on the ground with with uh, groups who have a stake in it, right? So they're not going to the White House. They're not going to a senator. They're working at local levels, um, and most of the um, successes have happened on a small scale, and then they build on that. So if you go all the way back to changing the norms about why we're not smoking in this room right now, you can trace it all the way back to California and very local levels where the scientists partnered with the community-based groups who wanted to implement um, clean air laws and building the science base for that and what it would take to get their local, you know, county board to be convinced. And that's, you know, how originally it was done. So that, that same kind of coalition building model is what you do when you're doing this kind of modeling. It's no different. It's about dialogue. It's about creating groups that have a common interest and then trying to come together and building the common language around that. And, and as it was noted before, it's an iterative process. So it won't be the case that you'll just go to a legislature or a county board and say, here's the science. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a kind of building of relationships process. Uh, it's a huge topic. I would suggest three pragmatic strategies for your consideration. Um, the first of them is a communication strategy, um, which is to lead with surprises. Um, and to, you know, very good models often have this flavor that after it's explained to you, you think you knew it already, um, the result. Um, so it's important to sort of communicate them by, by, um, by elucidating views about what the, what the answer might be, and then demonstrate how a model actually produces novel insights that you didn't think you knew ahead of time. And even if uh, there are lots of other results that are more in keeping with conventional wisdom, if you highlight those that are surprising, it demonstrates the value of the models as what is adding in, a, in sharp relief. The second strategy is that models, in my view, get the most acceptance when people not only understand what the results of the model show, but why, uh, and developing a narrative about why and intuition, um, which can be hard in a complex model. I mean, one of the reasons I think all three of us use agent-based models sometimes is that they lend themselves to that kind of explanation of why, um, which is very powerful to the policy audience. And the third thing uh, I would suggest as a strategy is uh, that it, there's an education role that's central here. Uh, and um, it's important not only uh, as more and more people want to enter into what's seen as a vibrant space like the intersection of multi-scale modeling and population health, there's, there's, there aren't necessarily enough training opportunities and you want to make sure that the best practices are actually communicated and followed. But there's also an education role in educating policymakers and how to talk to modelers and what, what it even means and what the differences between different kinds of models are and things like this. And so I, I teach an NIH-funded R25 summer course 
um, every summer that actually has uh, attendees who are, who are graduate students, but also who are, who are policymakers and public health practitioners uh, who attend that course. And it's designed to take you from basically no knowledge of these methods to a pretty sophisticated to consumer level um, understanding of them. And that's, I think, a really important function. And these guys do a lot of teaching, too. I just want to add just a couple of things. I think one, maybe you said it implicitly, is you have to be patient as well. And I can just tell you two quotes to give you a sense for um, when scientists think that this is not worth it. Um, and this is not in, uh, this is an international uh, uh, policy analyst. And after spending about a two hour period with him explaining why this would be helpful during the H1N1 pandemic, uh, the person essentially uh, told me, you're a mathematician and you can prove anything you want. Uh, okay. So this, this kind of a skepticism that model, uh, mo you know, the analyst had is, is important, and you, you don't want to sort of just decouple at that point of time. There's another quote of the same kind that we have heard what Ross is saying. So my, my colleague in Switzerland actually tried to pitch a, a modeling uh, a story to, to a policy analyst there, and he actually summarized it well by saying, if the model produces things which are very obvious, then the analyst say, you know, I don't think so I need the model. I, I think I could certainly see it myself. If the thing is too surprising, then they say, I don't trust this. <laughs> so you are actually, so to some extent, surprises are good, but there's a balance between the whole thing uh, that we need to strike. So I just thought I'll add uh, to the mix. So, of course, uh, excellent points there. Um, so just to add a few more. Uh, you know, policymakers, decision makers, just like any very busy people with a lot of responsibilities, are more likely to be interested in something that makes their lives easier. So, um, so going in with that understanding, like you know, how are you going to make their lives easier? How are you going to improve their decision making? And not in a way in which they have to invest a huge amount up front. Like if you tell them, okay, this can help your decision making, but it's going to take two years of really hard work, they're unlikely to um, be willing to do that. They might be intellectually curious, of course, but they just don't have the time. So finding ways to to really help with even small decisions like this will help uh, make things easier, this will help clarify things, putting yourself in their shoes and say, okay, what would make my life easier if I were in their shoes? That's, that's one. Secondly, um, there can be a tendency to, to, to make modeling seem separate from what people are doing, but if you think about it, modeling is really what people do every day. So whenever people make decisions, whenever they assess something, they are modeling in their head, right? So, uh, you know, experience is basically adding to your mental model. Instinct is basically the result of your models in your head making quick decisions without you realizing it. When you can pose modeling in a way that is understandable and actually communicates with the decision makers, say, oh yeah, I do that. You're just basically taking what's in my head and putting it on the table so I can see it. Um, or helping people understand that this is really not something obscure, something arcane, something that's done just as an intellectual exercise. This is really part of all of us, what we do. Then they can actually start connecting with the model. Because as you recall, a lot of science has shown that people, when people attach themselves to things, they have to attach themselves emotionally to it as well. So the more you make it accessible, the more you make it seem like this is not like a huge leap, but this is the next natural uh, step in decision making, I think they're more willing to accept this. One more question from the audience. So both Ross and Bruce said that, um, kind of, I may be paraphrasing, that the model depends on the question asked. What in case there are multiple models and multiple questions? How do you handle this and do you have examples on this? I think I would rephrase it is that good models are designed to answer specific questions not that the model necessarily depends on the question. You can use the same model to answer multiple questions sometimes. But the decisions you make along the way about what goes into the model, what doesn't go into the model, how you test the model, what kind of analyses you do with the model really should be driven, should flow from what the question or the goal is in the first place. Um, that said, that does mean that uh, very different questions are likely to entail very different models. And I think that's appropriate actually, uh, particularly in a policy context. Um, I, I used to have a colleague who I won't name who believed that I had this thing called the model. 
that lived in my office under my desk and I fed it, you know, scraps of my lunch and any policy question I could take out the model and it would, it would have an answer. Um, and I mean, this is a caricature, but you can see why this kind of thinking, which is actually not uncommon, is dangerous because uh, a model of uh, Ebola is not going to necessarily uh, be the right thing to help you solve an M MRSA uh, epidemic, right? Because they're very different. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the question about when and how models can be reused and what the limits you place around the use of your model are is actually an area where more work is needed among this community um, and where a lot of thought needs to go in before you, uh, you enter the bright glare of, of policymaking. And also there is room for multiple models to address a single question. Um, so not, no model is perfect. Uh, they're all going to be based on different assumptions, different data sets. Um, they might be even framing the question in different ways. Um, so I've seen situations where we said, okay, well, we already used the model to answer that question. But just because that's happened, that doesn't mean there's room for other models. It would be similar to saying, well, we've already done a clinical trial on that, so we don't need to do any more clinical trials for the rest of our uh, eternity. But as we know, multiple clinical trials have different uh, positives and negatives and, and uh, perspectives, et cetera. So I think um, when we're addressing especially key policy questions, there is room for multiple models as long as it's understood you know, what each of those different models brings to the table. Right? Uh, as long as the modelers are very clear that, okay, in this model we're really focusing on this perspective or we're really focusing on this time frame or these outcome measures. And then these models are different this way. So, you know, similar when you, when you look at conversion and diversion validation, there will be situations where three separate models are supposed to come up with the same answer, but there will be situations in which those three separate models should actually come up with different answers. If they come up with the same answer, but they're built differently, then there's something wrong. So that really adds uh, three-dimensionality to the question and really the understanding of the question. So there should be room for that. Can I just take 30 seconds? So the, the, the PNAS paper that uh, the MIDAS group wrote uh, um, on, on this topic where as I said, Ira's group and uh, Neil's group and our group uh, worked on a same problem that Richard Hatchett uh, put forward. Um, and the models did not necessarily agree in terms of numbers at all. Uh, they're also slightly different technologies as well. But I think the models agreed towards a trend. And I think a good policymaker actually doesn't necessarily want all models to be convergent. Um, the diversity in models is as interesting as the, as the convergence of the model because they see they see differences and they want to, so far as you can explain why they might be coming, they're actually much more happy in, in a setting like that because they realize that good, most models ignore some aspect of it and they want to understand what that, that might have been to uh, the decisions to be led. So our last question for the panel would be from the wiki. Uh, I'll try to spell it out as clearly as possible. Uh, to the panel, uh, have any of you engaged the subject communities or community members in instantiating your behavioral rules? We are considering using a geospatial ABM of Chicago to evaluate epidemiology of urban violence, uh, but there is a wide range of hypotheses about how people behave and what drives decision making. We would think about using such a model as a rhetorical device which implies that all the models are inherently suspicious. Um, so yes, in my, uh, if I think if I understand the question correctly, my compact study that I alluded to earlier, a, a central part of that involves engagement with uh, 26 different communities, um, and they're actually engaged in, in some of the modeling um, in a participatory way, and uh, there's a very complex and messy part of the process, as you can imagine, one has to use a lot of care in, um, in taking at face value what people self-report about how they make decisions, for example, or not necessarily the right thing to put into a model. Um, but you can gain a lot of face validity for a model in this way. The other thing that I would just quickly highlight that's complicated that a lot of attention has to be paid to is that when you're engaging with a community, you're really doing two things at once, and one of them is um, you are taking from the community potentially things which are in the service of generalized science which are going into a model, but you are also uh, intervening in that community, changing their behavior and their mental models uh, in a way that hopefully benefits them. 
Uh, and sometimes these two things can coexist harmoniously, but sometimes there is real tension between those two goals, and uh, thinking that through has, has taken a lot of time and energy. Uh, so with, with behavioral modeling, um, I guess there's several things to be careful about. One is, and I mentioned this previously, we want to make sure that the models aren't predicting a specific outcome or a specific situation. You know, human behavior is difficult, and it's hard to predict how humans will actually behave under a situation. You know, we can have data that suggests, but I, we, there are many examples where there are one or multiple people that will behave very differently under times of stress or in different situations. It can, so it's, it's more important that the model shows you know, here's our different possibilities, here are different scenarios, and here's what might happen if people behave in this way or, or they change their behaviors. Again, it's elucidating relationships. I think we get into trouble anytime we say that model can make, models can make specific, precise uh, predictions. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of our good uh, colleagues and collaborators, Phil Coley, likes to say that a model is not a scalpel, but it's a sledgehammer in the sense that you know, if you're expecting it to say, okay, this specific person will behave in this way or this specific outcome will happen, you're going to be disappointed. But if you say that we want to enact certain interventions or policies that can account for or accommodate the range of different possible behaviors, that's more realistic. So for instance, if you say, if you, you run a model and you say, okay, there's a probability that 1% or 5% or 10% of people may completely not may be completely non-compliant with uh, a particular policy or intervention, will that policy still be effective? And if you show that, for instance, up to 20% of people can be non-compliant and the policy is still effective, that gives you an idea that that policy has some degree of robustness. In other words, not everyone has to follow it. Whereas if you run a policy or intervention that requires 100% compliance, that tells you that that policy or intervention is probably not going to be a fix because we know someone's going to go off the farm at some point. So again, it's, it's not predicting, it's understanding relationships. I just add one point because I, I want to, I think this community uh, should feel uh, happy about it. I think the systems biology, I've been attending this meeting for five years now, uh, Grace. I think the folks here in the systems biology community have actually made tremendous progress in making their models transparent and the assumptions stated. I think the social sciences work that we are all doing is, I would say, not at the same stage as you folks are. So that's something that we, we should learn from you folks in terms of making these models accessible uh, and transparent. There's one program that I just started out of DARPA that we are a part of. Uh, Adam Russell is the program manager. And it's, it's, uh, it's the whole intent is to make, try and make this much more precise. It's called the Next Generation Social Science Program. I just started, you can take a uh, look at it on the web, uh, but tries to make even a very simple setting where, you know, in a, a simple game like ultimatum game, if you try to specify the things precisely, it turns out to be a really complicated issue on, on its own. Its own. So let's give a round of applause for this panel and this theme.